When my life work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and His smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, and redeemed by His side I shall stand. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, by the print of the nails in His hand. Oh, the soul-thrilling rapture when I view His blessed face, and the luster of His kindly beaming eye. How my full heart will praise Him for His mercy, love, and grace that prepared for me a mansion in the sky. Oh, the dear ones in glory, how they beckon me to come. And our parting at the river I recall. To the sweet vales of Eden, they will sing my welcome home. But I long to meet my Savior most of all. Through the gates of the city, in a robe of spotless white, He will lead me where no tears will ever fall. In the glad song of ages, I shall mingle with delight, but I long to meet my Savior first of all. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, and redeemed by His side I shall stand. I shall know Him, I shall know Him by the print of the nails in His hand. Amen. All right, we'll do another song that I think all of you know. It's a chorus. Let's forget about ourselves. Magnify the Lord and worship Him. Let's forget about ourselves. Magnify the Lord and worship Him. Let's forget about ourselves. Magnify the Lord and worship Him. Oh, worship Him, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's forget about ourselves. Magnify the Lord, He's coming soon. Let's forget about ourselves. Magnify the Lord, He's coming soon. Let's forget about ourselves. Magnify the Lord, He's coming soon. He's coming soon, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's forget about ourselves. Magnify the Lord and praise His name. Let's forget about ourselves. Magnify the Lord and praise His name. Let's forget about ourselves. Magnify the Lord and praise His name. Oh, praise His name, Jesus Christ our Lord. I'd like you to take your Bible and open with me tonight to the book of Job, chapter 33. We started this uh, message uh, earlier on Sunday morning, and uh, 
We only got through the very first portion of Scripture. And uh, really the, uh, the theme of this chapter is found in verse 14. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. God speaks once, and he doesn't have to speak again, but he does. In fact, many times God will speak over and over and over to us. You just stop and think about how many times you heard the gospel or you heard about Jesus or you heard the Bible and you went right on in your rebellion to God. I went to Sunday school as a boy and I heard about Jesus and and I you know I listened to different preachers and and uh, my grandmother talked to me about God but I went my way when I got about 13 I started you know deciding I knew better than my parents did and uh, you know how a lot of young people they get be teenagers and they think they know everything and uh, yet God kept speaking to me and uh, but the, the thing is in most cases God speaks and God speaks but we don't perceive it we don't hear it and until God gives us ears to hear effectually we will never hear this is why salvation is such a uh, a glorious thing because a person may hear a thousand times the gospel and uh, they'll hear certain parts of the gospel and it just doesn't make any sense to them. And then finally, God makes it real in your life and you hear and you take God serious. Well, we, uh, we're going to begin reading at verse 12. Uh, we covered verses 1 through 11. And uh, we come to verse 12. And Now these are the words of Elihu, who was uh, the youngest of the four friends of Job. Remember that uh, Job had, first of all, these three men that were contemporaries. And then he had this younger man, Elihu, who also spoke to him. And of course, the contentions of all three men was that Job was a secret sinner. That all of these trials came on Job because Job in his private life was committing sin. And Job was saying, I'm not a perfect man but I am living my life to the best of my ability and I'm doing my best to honor God and there is no glaring uh, rebellion in my life against God. But they didn't believe Him. They said nothing like this would happen to a man if he was really doing what God wants him to do. Now I'm not saying Job didn't learn a lot. But we know that the sufferings that came on Job were not because Job was being punished. A lot of people think when they read the book of Job and they think, well, Job had all that happen to him because Job deserved it. Well, I guess in a sense we could say we all deserve to go to hell if God gave us what we deserved. But a person can be living for God and doing the best they can in honoring God, and they may have terrible things happen in their life, and that does not necessarily mean that they're being judged by God. And we ought to, we ought to be very careful about condemning people. You know, we see a little child that's maybe got some terrible illness, 
and we blame it on the parents or people will say, well, they must have done something to have caused that. You remember even the, the Pharisees did that with Jesus with the blind man. <clears throat> they said, did he sin in the womb? Because they had a tradition that you could sin in the womb. Or did his parents sin? And Jesus said, neither one is true. He said, this is happening in the Gospel of John for the glory of God, that God might be glorified. All right, now with all that said, now let's, let's kind of delve into this in verse 12. He says, Behold in this thou art not just. I will answer thee that God is greater than man. Now we can amen that. We know that God is greater than man. Uh, man was created by God from the dust of the earth. And as a creation of God, man is uh, one day that we're going to judge angels. But we've been made a little lower than the angels in creation. But the children of God one day are going to stand in judgment of angels according to the Apostle Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians. He goes on and he says, Why dost thou strive against him? Now, this question, he's asking Job, Job, why do you strive against God? Now, Job wasn't striving against God, was he? This, was a, this is what we call a straw man. There are a lot of people like to build straw men and then they like to tear down or burn down their straw man. And they'll make up a situation and then they'll fit you right into it and then they'll say, yeah, that's you. When they have no idea about what's really going on in your life. Job wasn't fighting against God. He says, for, notice, he giveth not account of any of his matters. And this is that he's saying that God doesn't have to give an account, and that is true. Daniel uh, tells us that he doeth what he wills in the army of heaven, and there is none that can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? God can do whatever he wants to do because he's God. He could have passed over us and never saved us. And we wouldn't have had any uh, just cause to condemn God for doing that. But God does answer. The Bible tells us that God cannot lie. The Bible tells us that God is just. He's just in all of His dealings. God cannot be unjust because it would violate His holy nature. Then he goes on and he says, For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. Now he touches on dreams. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men in slumberings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction, that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. He keepeth back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. Now he does speak some real truth here because we know that in times past God has spoken to men through dreams. He spoke to Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Belshazzar, and other, other times in the Bible. Uh, but in our day and age we don't live by dreams. We live by the Word of God. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that in these last days, God has spoken unto us by His Son. So God speaks to us primarily in our day and time through the Word of God. 
the Word of God is inspired, infallible, and errant. And that's why it's so important that we read the Bible daily, that we go to church, that we pray, that we uh, continually keep ourselves close. Remember uh, the church at Laodicea. Uh, they had grown lukewarm. And the Lord said, I would that you were either cold or hot. But because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you or spit you out of my mouth. I'll vomit you out. You know, uh, most time people don't like things that are lukewarm. They either want it hot or cold. You want hot coffee or you'll get iced coffee. Now, some people like things lukewarm. You know, my wife likes her water room temperature. I don't like room temperature water. I like mine cold. You know, I put mine in the refrigerator and they get ice cold. And when I was a boy growing up, we had a well and we had a spring and we'd have one of the metal dippers and we'd drop that big metal well and we'd draw that water out. And you'd be so cold teeth when you would put that metal dipper up to your, your mouth to drink that cold water. And when it get, uh, you know, that cold water felt so good. Now, you know, uh, when I was in Bible college, I went to college with a boy from Peru, and they had a tradition in Peru that drinking cold water will give you a cold. And he wouldn't drink cold water. He said, why don't you know drinking cold water will make you sick? And I said, well, I've drunk cold water all my life. It didn't make me sick. And he said, well, it, it will. So he never would drink cold water. But the Lord said of the Laodiceans, he said, I wish you were either cold. I just wish you'd quit altogether. I'd rather you be cold or be hot. But don't be lukewarm because I'll spit you out of my mouth. Now, we got to stay close to God, and God speaks to us through our hearts, through our minds, through His Word. The Holy Spirit will talk to you. He will, he will guide you. The, the Spirit of God is the Comforter who will guide you into all truth. And uh, we see that Elihu is speaking to Job, and he's talking about God speaking through a dream. Young Elihu spoke in his wordy, imprecise way. He, uh, it certainly was true that God is greater than man, but that did not mean that Elihu could or should answer Job in the way that he did. Yet, he made a very strong connection between God and his own mind, as if he knew the mind of God. Uh, be careful when somebody uh, takes upon themselves too much authority and they think that they know the mind of God and uh, that they're somehow God to you. Nobody can be God for you. God speaks to you through your heart and He don't need a preacher or a priest or anyone for you to confess your sins to Jesus Christ is the advocate with the Father. And when you go to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord will hear you just as much as He hears anybody else. Because you're His child. Now, are you a righteous person? Are you walking the life you're supposed to be walking? If you say that you love God and you pray and yet your life is a is nothing but hypocrisy and you're living like a hypocrite, do you think God's going to answer you? Now, He, he may, but in, in most cases, He probably won't. There have been times where God has answered people even when they were out of His will, like Jonah. You know, Jonah was uh, set against God, but God still worked through His life and used him even though Jonah was backslidden. But be careful when somebody thinks that they, they know more than God does because they'll lead you into trouble. you got all these modern day men, they'll tell you, oh, I'm a prophet and I can tell you what's going to happen in the future. And I, 
you know, you got this, this guy named Khan, and he's a con, all right. And he comes on YouTube and all over TV, and, and you know, he's got, he looks like uh, uh, that, that guy on the, the, the monsters, you know, the way he's got that hair combed down. And, but he wants you to believe that he's some great prophetic preacher. I was just reading an article about him, and he's made hundreds of prophecies, and over half of them have been lies. Now, when somebody prophesies and it don't come true, they have just proven they are a false prophet. The only kind of prophecy you ought to be giving is the Word of God. You stay with the Word of God and you won't get in trouble. But when you start doing things in the flesh and making prophecies that are just of man, you're going to get yourself into some trouble. Amen. He goes on and he says, uh, uh, it's like uh, his mind is a, a common place for God to dwell. Why do you contend with him? And uh, Job may speak in one way, or God may speak to Job in one way or another way. And his thought here is that God had spoken to Job already, that, that God had told Job, but Job had not perceived it. It could have been through a dream. It could have been through a vision. God had warned Job, he's saying, but Job, you didn't listen. Because really deep down, Job, you're a secret sinner. Now that's what his real thrust is in the, in the message. And then he goes on in verse 16, and he says, He opens the ears of men and silleth their instruction, that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. And that is true. Many times God will uh, bring people to the end of their way and will, you know, let you go on in your pride. Uh, I was watching a thing about all these different people who have mocked God. Uh, you know, that Irish, that guy from Ireland, I can't even think of his name now. I, I probably shouldn't even call his name, but he's a big boxer. And, and he got on there and he said he could even whoop God. And he said that if he got in a fight with Jesus, he would whoop his, and he said a bad word, you know, and just bragging. But he got in the ring and he, he got his lights put out real quick. And, and there's just been a host of different people who boasted and bragged. This one woman got up and, and was mocking God and she fell down right there on the stage and had a heart attack. Another man was praising Allah and cursing uh, uh, God and he dropped with a, with a massive heart attack. Tell you what, you don't, God is not mocked. When you get up and you, you say things and, and you're so arrogant and filled with pride and you don't think God can't knock you down, you're in for a rude awakening. God can kill me right where I am right now. That's why I want to be careful about everything I say and everything I preach and everything that I do because I'm going to give an answer to my Heavenly Father. Now he goes on and he, he, he says uh, in verse number 19, he enters into the uh, next part of his speech. He says basically that God has spoken your sufferings to save your soul from death. He chasteneth, he is chastened also with pain upon his bed and the multitude of his bones with strong pain. All right. I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't question people do have pain. Now, I'll tell you, I lived in pain for over 25 years. Serious, cutting, chronic back pain. I could not get rid of it. I don't care what I did. I had injections. I had operations. They did everything in the world to me. But it wasn't my back necessarily. It was what I was eating. The food I was eating was killing me. And when I changed my diet and I stopped eating all the foods that I had been eating all my life, 
I cut sugar out of my diet and I cut all those things out and it was almost like a, a veil had been lifted and the pain left my body. My wife can tell you, she got to see it every bit. And I went from walking like a 90 year old man to walking straight up. And it wasn't because God was doing that to me even though I cried and I prayed and I said, Lord, why am I hurting so bad? Why am I suffering so much? But it wasn't God making me suffer. It was my own ignorance about what I was doing to my own body. We never know what's going to happen in our lives. Our bodies change. Things happen to us as we get older. And... Uh, and it's not always doctors that know what's going on. Uh, you know more about your health than anybody. And you know how things affect you. And, and, and when, when you find something that will work for you, then that's what you got to do. you got to keep trying to you know, find an answer, find a way to get better. But never give up because there's always hope as long as you're alive. There's always hope that you can get better. God can, can move upon you and He can give you wisdom. So his conclusion is that uh, Job had all this pain and Job did. He had sores from his head to his feet and uh, so that his life abhorreth bread and his soul dainty meat. I used to. I dreaded eating. And when I would eat, Within 10 minutes, I'd have so much pain in my legs. And I'd tell Kathy, I'd say, Darling, just go in there and get that chainsaw and cut my legs off. I said, It wouldn't take me a minute, just take a chainsaw and cut my legs off. And, and I, I couldn't figure out why. And, uh, and I'm sure that Job was in all kinds. Now, Job's situation was that uh, Satan had told God. If he would let him at Job, Job would curse God to his face, didn't he? So it wasn't that God was necessarily just mad at Job. It was that Satan was getting at Job to make him curse God. Then he says, in verse 21, His flesh is consumed away that it cannot be seen, and his bones that were not seen stick out. So Job had evidently lost so much weight and, you know, he was so sick, he probably was vomiting and probably had dysentery and, I mean, he was just in an awful condition. And many times when people get consumption and, you know, some of those diseases, they just, they can't get better. Um, and then he says that... Uh, Yea, his soul draweth near unto the grave, and his life to the destroyers. He's getting near to death. Death is coming. We know that death is going to come to all of us, unless the Lord takes us out, unless the Lord comes and, and we're taken out before uh, he comes again. But uh, if we live long enough on this earth, it's appointed unto men once to die. And after this, the judgment. But we don't, as a child of God, we don't have to be afraid of death. Now, I'll tell you, I've gotten close to death several times. And when I was lost, I was scared to death when I nearly died. I mean, I literally was, I was in a panic. But after I got saved, and there have been several times when I came close to dying, I wasn't afraid at all. When I had my heart rate ran up, uh, I mean, it was way over 200 beats a minute, and my heart was running away. And my wife was saying, darling, i got to get you to the hospital. And I said, darling, just let me go in and lay down on the bed. I, I'm just ready to go on. Just, just let me lay down, and, and the Lord will take me on home. But she said, no, no, you're going to go to the doctor. You're, going, you're not going to die. But I felt so bad, I just... I was just ready to quit. And, uh, you know, drinking different things that speed your heart up. 
I tell you, you got to be careful with caffeine and these energy drinks. Stay away from these energy drinks because they can make your heart speed up and your heart, they'll have to stop your heart to slow it down. This happens all the time to people. And they don't even realize what they're doing to themselves. Uh, <clears throat> and then he says, Yet there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand, to show unto man his uprightness. God does have certain people that speak the truth and will teach the word of God. And he will keep your soul back from the pit. But Job wasn't paying attention, he was saying. And uh, there have been visions, he said, but uh, God is now speaking, Job, through your suffering. And here the main contention of his argument took shape is that through suffering, God is dealing with men to bring them into a higher place. And suffering does purify us. You know, before silver is... Uh, made pure, it has to go through a refining. And before gold becomes pure, it has to be refined. And the Lord does allow certain amounts of suffering. Uh, a lot of times we don't really have a lot to say until we've been through something, do we? You know, it, it, when, when, you're, uh, when you're going through trials and you're going through heartaches, you want to talk to somebody who's been through something who can help you, who's experienced that, right? I mean, you, you, you want somebody that, that's not a novice, but somebody who's experienced that, and, and there is some truth to that. And then he says, uh, uh, of course, we know that that one real man that uh, sets people right is Jesus Christ. He is the one among a thousand. He is the bright and morning star. He's the lily of the valley. He is the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. He died. He was buried. He was resurrected from the dead. And there will be no other Messiah. I'll tell all of the Jewish nation uh, that would listen to me, there will be no other Messiah. He come. And those folks who are waiting, they are waiting in vain because Christ has come and God has validated that Christ has come and He's been resurrected from the dead to authenticate His work as Messiah. And then we see that He's gracious in the view of Elihu. God would only receive and respond to His messenger if he would only admit to God's uprightness that God would restore Job to favor. If Job would receive God's grace, he would be rescued from the pit. He would be healed. His flesh would become, notice he says, it would become like a little child again. Notice verse uh, 25. His flesh shall be fresher than a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. You know, there is, I've read stories of, of a man who was up in his 80s and he was near death and, uh, and did, this was in the Kentucky uh, Explorer. It's not in the Bible. But supposedly all the people that knew him, they thought he was going to die. But suddenly he got this miraculous healing and his hair had turned gray, and all of a sudden it turned dark again. And he started going out and working and doing stuff, and he was, he was like a young man again and lived up, up over 100 years old. There are stories about that that you read about in history. And, you know, he's saying that. In most cases, that's not what happens. People find out they're bad sick. Maybe they've got cancer. And uh, like this one gentleman... He lived three weeks. The doctor told him, said, you're, you're covered with uh, lung cancer. He was a heavy smoker. We were driving to church, 
and there's a, a man standing out by the side of the road, and boy, he was going to town. And I started singing to Kathy that little song, Smoke, Smoke, Smoke That Cigarette. Huff, puff, puff, puff yourself to death. You ain't going to huff and puff no more upon that golden shore where I understand there's no cigarettes. But you know, people will take that stuff right in their lungs, and then they get lung cancer, and they will say, I wonder what I did wrong. Well, you've been smoking those things for 40, 50, 60 years, and you've been taking that into your lungs. It's a wonder you didn't get it before then. Now, am I condemning, you? Am I condemning people who smoke? No. My mom and dad smoked. I had to grow up with it as a boy, and I hated it. But I had to live with it. They'd get in the car, both of them start smoking. And I'd say, oh, please, don't do that. Now, I don't know why I didn't smoke, but I hated cigarettes from the time I was a little boy. And, uh, and I, I know that it was just God that, you know, protected me from that. There were other things that I didn't hate, but that was one thing I did hate. And, uh, but he says, he will deliver his soul from going into the pit. Lo, all this. God oftentimes with man to bring back his soul from the pit to be enlightened with the light of the living. Mark well, O Job, hearken unto me. Hold thy peace. I will speak. Boy, you can just, you can just feel the arrogance in him, can't you? Hold your peace, Job. You just be quiet and shut up and let me talk. I'm the one that knows what's going on here. If thou hast anything to say, answer me. You got any arguments, Job? Well, I'm going to tell you something. When this book closes down, there is somebody who speaks, and it's God. And Elihu puts his hand on his mouth, and so does Job. And the Lord tells them all, He said, You all be quiet, because you have not spoken that which was right about my servant Job. And when he prays for you, then I'll restore you. But notice how Elihu, he says, Answer me, speak, for I desire to justify thee. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you really care about him. You want to, you want to help him out. You don't want to help him out. You want to condemn him. You'd be amazed at how many people uh, will talk to you and they don't really care about helping you. They want to lead you further into darkness. They want to mess you up even more because misery loves company. Don't listen to people whose lives are already messed up because if you listen to them, they'll mess you up. Listen to God. Follow those who are walking in truth and you will see that it will make a vast difference in your life. Now, uh, we see that in verse number 33, if not, hearken unto me, hold thy peace, and I shall, I shall teach thee wisdom. We could, we could say that Elihu was a self-centered man. He was a narcissist. It was all about me. You know, I'm right. I, I've got the wisdom. And I want to leave you with this in closing. This article is entitled Self-Centered. From an unknown source comes an article titled How to Be Miserable. And here's how to be miserable. Think about yourself. Talk about yourself. Use I as often as possible. Mirror yourself continually in the opinion of others. Listen greedily to what people say about you. Expect to be appreciated. Be suspicious. Be jealous. Be envious. Be sensitive to anyone's slights. And never forgive those who criticize. Trust nobody but yourself, insist on 
people giving you consideration and respect, demand agreement with your views on everything, and pout or sulk when people are ungrateful for the favor you show them. Never forget a service you have rendered. Now that's how to be miserable. One man said, uh, it was, he was asked if actors had any traits that set them apart from other human beings. He said, without a doubt, you can pick out actors by the glazed look that comes into their eyes when the conversation wanders away from themselves. The glazed look when somebody talks about something else. This other lady said, I gave a little tea party this afternoon at three. It was very small. Three guests in all. I, myself, and me. Myself ate all the sandwiches while I drank all the tea. Twas also I who ate the pie and passed the cake to me. You may have heard the story of two friends who met for dinner in a restaurant. Each requested a filet of fish. And after a few minutes, the waiter came back with their order. Two pieces of fish, one was large, one was small, on the platter. One of the men proceeded to serve his friend, placing the small piece on a plate, and he handed it across the table to his friend. His friend said, well, you certainly have nerve. Well, what's troubling you, asked the other. Look what you've done, he answered. You've given me the little piece, and you kept the big one for yourself. He looked at him, he said, well, how would you have done it? The man said, if it were me serving, I would have given you the big piece. The man grinned and replied and said, well, I've got it, haven't I? What's the point? <laughs> oh boy, Elihu was full of himself. And uh, sorry folks, but we uh, just came to the conclusion there. Uh, if we learn anything, we, we do know that God speaks once, God speaks twice. And uh, many times we don't hear Him. And uh, when He speaks... Let's pray that God would uh, help us to have sensitive hearts and sensitive ears because when God speaks, He deserves to be heard. Amen. All right, let's stand. Brother Chapman, you want to lead us in a song? Amen.